Okay, you, you, we're, we're back. We're back online. So go ahead. You started so, to say. I mean, what I was going to say is that uh, you know, I mean, we we have actually it's a tough business taking care of cancer patients, but it's the you know we couldn't have a better job, right? I I don't think because I just think of uh, one of my patients. I you know the guy has been through chemotherapy. He's been through a transplant, two transplants, and he he's gone through hell. Um, and I walk in the room and he says to me, Doc, you look tired. Did you, get some, did you get enough sleep last night? So whatever problems you have in life, you look at these patients and say, I mean, how can I stop working my tail off to make you know, progress with their diseases? I mean, they're fighting so hard and they're so considerate of, the, of you and their family and everybody that's taking care of them, you gotta, you gotta push for them. And you know, in clinical research is one way you can do this. And, uh, I, I, I wish I could say that clinical re research was completely free. It is in a sense, but the cost of care associated with clinical research has also got to be free. And that's one of the other things that as academic physician scientists we'd like to fight for, and that is when people participate in clinical trials, whatever the trial is, whether it's a phase one, a phase two, or a phase three, that the standard cost of care associated with those clinical trials is also supported by providers, which is not always the case. And that chases patients away and prevents them from accessing new treatments. And, and slows you down, I guess. Slows us down. Hate to be slowed down. Is it frustrating doing what you do for the American Cancer Society in a state that has the lowest uh, tobacco tax, as you pointed out, or it has <laughs> um, patchwork smoking bans that I, I think you believe would make a difference? Yeah, I mean, I brought it up early for a reason. It's something that is so simple that we can do and make a huge impact in our state. And it's gotta be done, and there's support for it. People can't just, they can just choose not to smoke. Right, and we're trying to get education out there, but when tobacco companies are targeting kids, we have to be able to protect them as well. And if we can raise cigarette tax and have funding to help educate and prevent and even uh, change packages, pa change as they did before, you know, advertising, if we can continue to make that stricter to make sure that people understand the risks when they pick it up. We think everyone knows and understands, but do they? Because why do they choose to begin smoking? And we also have to understand how difficult it is to quit. To quit. You know, average seven attempts mm -hmm. to be successful at quitting been, smoking. Been there, you've just seen people going through it. Well, seeing people going through it, and it's an initiative uh, with the FQACs. Uh, right now, we're mandated to uh, do tobacco cessation with all of our patients, and we have it reported to the feds, and now they're holding us accountable to show results. So I understand it, and we're in Missouri, so I hope we can have some success, some success there. People ask about the cost of health care. That's a huge burden on the cost of health care, mm -hmm. and so there's a reason why they're asking and they're following up and making this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking for more questions from Twitter. Uh, there has to, there's a few things on here. It, we, we just barely touched on the research funding aspect of things. Uh, how serious is that situation? Uh, is that dire? Yes. <laughs> dire. Put, put it in context for us. Why oh, is it dire? So has it gotten worse? Did it used to be better? It, uh, the, so the National Institutes of Health is the major funder of basic in uh, biomedical research in this country. Uh, and it's had a flat budget for what, guys, 10, 15 years. Um, and While the cost of what you're doing goes yeah. up, there's yes. general so, inflation, things like um, that. And where it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of research to be done in large projects. Um, and what is really, really hard now are for young investigators, right? People who uh, have just started their academic careers, um, you know, everybody has to write grants. You have to try to get funding. You've got an idea. Um, there's a lot of smart people that, that put in grants to the NIH, and I think the percentage of them now who actually receive their first grant is what? 17%, 13%? It's, it's, it's quite low. Well, that's one of the metrics that we follow when we're looking at um, funding and the availability of funding is the pay line. And so 10 years ago or 15 years ago, the pay line was between 25 and 30%. So of the grants that were submitted, almost 30% of them were funded. And now the pay line is you know, 10, 11%. So there's been a dramatic decrease in the pay line for these NIH grants, even 
you know, in the last 10 to 15 years. So, I mean, if the pay line's 8 to 10 percent, that means 92 percent of the applications are not being funded. So it would be okay if those 92% of applications were coming from unqualified characters, but most of them are coming from well-established, distinguished in t at times, and at, and at other times, junior investigators who are outstanding, but just don't make the cut. And so um, in, the, in your lifespan without funding in academic medicine today is unfortunately short. You can't continue to support people that can't get funding forever. And so we have a natural attrition from academic medicine and from science, which is worrisome. They say the same to me about this show. Um, <laughs> no funding, it won't be on forever. Sorry. Last word, we're just about out of time. What would you like those on a personal level who are dealing with this to know that you've learned? I would say to always remember that you're not alone. I think that's the biggest thing, and for caregivers too, to know that you need support. I know when my husband went through it, I told him he needed to find somebody to talk to and be honest with because I was too busy fighting mm -hmm. and, and going through treatment. So you're not alone, I think is the most important thing to know. And there's always hope, there's always hope.